Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise. We bring you interviews with professionals in the movement and exercise field. The goal is to provide information for other professionals and also amateur movement aficionados, people who understand that movement is part of what makes life complete. Some of the people we interview you will have heard of. They're well known in and outside of the movement and exercise profession. Others you may not have heard of, but they have a great deal of knowledge to share. Many people doing the best work spend their time working with people, not working on their social media presence. We're going to give you a chance to learn from some of these talented and knowledgeable individuals, and we're going to learn along with you. Moving to Live podcasts are going to be short. Each interview will be long enough to impart usable information, but short enough to be able to be consumed in a single bout, during your workout, commute, or even during dinner prep. We all like long-form interviews, but time is valuable. Moving to Live wants to give you the option to learn and be entertained without needing to commit 60 minutes at a time for an interview. Give Moving to Live a listen. Check out our sister podcast, FitLab PGH, which highlights people, businesses, events, and activities in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area that make movement a priority. Moving to Live would love to hear from you. Want to connect with us or have an idea for somebody you think we ought to interview? Drop us an email, mov number 2 liv at gmail.com or connect with us on Instagram and Twitter, both underscore MOV number two LIV. We're excited to bring you these interviews, and we think you'll enjoy each and every one that we bring you. Welcome back to another podcast. I'm Ben Reuter. This is a dual podcast for Fitness Lab Pittsburgh, aka Fit Lab PGH, and Moving to Live. Both of them have the ethos movement is a lifestyle, not just an activity. Whichever one you're listening on, if you like what you hear, please leave us some feedback on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you listen to. Drop us a message and tell us what you like. Give us some suggestions for future interviews. If you're a FitLab PGH listener, then you definitely want to hear this interview because at some point you're probably going to hurt your back and you want to know who in the Pittsburgh area can either refer you to somebody who can help you or maybe help you and reduce the downtime. If you're listening on Moving to Live, then clearly... You understand the importance of breaking down knowledge silos. And I think today's guest, Dr. Michael Snyder, who's a chiropractor and a PhD teaching at the University of Pittsburgh, is definitely somebody you want to learn about. He's going to talk to us about his career path and his research in the area of low back pain. Dr. Snyder, thank you for taking time to talk to Pittsburgh FitLab PGH and moving to live. Sure. My pleasure. I guess the first question I want to ask, because I was first uh, made aware of you because I'm also guilty of these silo knowledge is you see somebody in the elevator, what's your 30 second elevator spiel of who are you or what do you do? Yeah. So my elevator spiel is that, um, I am a chiropractor by training, uh, working in a physical therapy department, um, doing back pain research on a full-time basis. And I know I want to touch briefly on how one goes from a career as a chiropractor seeing patients, which I know you did for many years, we won't say many, many years. And then you did a, not really a complete 180, but a big shift and decided to get a PhD. So briefly, how did you, or why did you decide to go into chiropractic medicine? And then what was the decision to kind of go and get some additional education and go from primarily patient care to doing research? Sure. And I, I did do kind of a 180 uh, mid career. So, um, but getting back to why did I go into chiropractic? I mean, it's interesting. I've heard somebody say this to me once before. You know, we choose our career paths when we're basically, you know, teenagers, <laughs> right? So I'm in, I'm, in, I'm doing undergrad studies. I went to um, State University of New York at Binghamton as a biology major, and I was, wanted to go into some kind of healthcare profession. And um, you know, I was was intrigued by sort of the the alternative fields to medicine. I didn't want to go to medical school. I wanted to do something else. And chiropractor just appealed to me. It was something different. It was alternative, um, kind of a ma- mainstream alternative, not a c- completely alternative medicine field. So I chose chiropractic as my, as my profession, um, being young and um, naive, I guess. And I know prior, really prior to moving to Pittsburgh and becoming acquainted with a number of chiropractors, my thought of chiropractors were they were somebody that you went to a couple of times a week for basically, I'm saying this in air quotes, back cracks. And I've learned over the past seven or eight years that there's really 
two directions that chiropractors go. There's those that do that. They want to get people in maybe on a subscription basis where they come in multiple times a week. And then there's others that I've been fortunate to meet where they work in a manner that's very similar to the way physiotherapists work in other countries or physical therapists work. Which direction when you started out in your career path were you, or was it entirely different when you started out as far as the directions that chiropractors tended to go? Well, I'm not embarrassed to tell you to my age and how long I've been in practice. I graduated from chiropractic school in 1982. So that's many, many years ago, well over 30 years ago. Um, and at that time, chiropractic had not quite evolved to where it is now. Um, but over the years since that time, we started seeing, I think, the boundaries between physical therapy and chiropractic professions getting blurred. And what I mean by that is probably in the late 90s, uh, Craig Liebenson, um, a chiropractor from Los Angeles, started to bring in this rehabilitation model um, to, to, to chiropractic. So prior to that, most chiropractors were just doing the manual as you call back cracking techniques, and then start blending rehabilitation techniques. At the same time, the physical therapy profession is going the other direction, where they're mainly just prescribing exercise, not putting their hands on people as much. And there was an interest in the PT profession in the 80s and 90s to start introducing more manual techniques. So I think we're seeing you know, blurring of the lines now, as evidenced by me, a chiropractor working in a physical therapy department. And what was the impetus after working as a chiropractor to, as you said, do a career 180, get a PhD in rehabilitative sciences and become more heavily a researcher? Yeah. So even when, when I was in clinical practice all those years, and I was in practice over 25 years before I decided to get a PhD, which is a very unusual thing I'm finding out. That's not the <laughs> typical PhD path. Um, but all those years I was in practice, it, it always kind of bothered me. I was helping people. But I was realizing, in a sense, we're experimenting on patients. I was doing things that I would learn at conferences or at um, reading books, and I just would do them on my patients, and I felt, part of me felt badly about that. Like, I don't know for sure that this works. I think it does. And so even when I was in practice, I was publishing papers and trying to get involved with research. It seemed like I always was being pulled in that direction. Um, so quite frankly, it was, it was family events that changed. You know, I have two kids. When I started getting into that empty nest part of life, so well, really what do I want to do now, right? I got my kids through um, high school and they're often going into college. I'm going to go back myself. And I think that's especially interesting. I always tell people when they say I followed the atypical career path, my dad was in his 70s when he went to law school just because his comment was, you know, I want to do something to stay busy and I really don't want to do something like be a greeter at Walmart. So he went to law school and now he's a part-time uh, public def defender in uh, the state of Indiana. That's wonderful. You go back to school, you get the PhD, and usually for people who are in the uh, doctoral professions, when they're in a the research profession, they have an area of research focus. How was it that you decided on, I'm going to become focused specifically on low back pain or low back injuries? So, um, well, first of all, I just thought about this, Ben. I, I wouldn't call it a 180, I would, because that implies reversing directions. I, I would say that it was sort of a quantum leap to another you know, another step in life where I was doing it all those years. Um, now I want to know why these, you know, get the answers to why some of these things worked or what didn't work. So just to be careful about that. Um, the other thing is that, um, I'm sorry, your question again was? My question was, how did you decide on the research focus of low back? Oh, so that's, that's another interesting thing. So when I graduated from chiropractic school back in 82, you know, the model of chiropractic was sort of all over the place. There were multiple models, right? The chiropractors treat mostly back and neck pain. Some chiropractors got into sports injuries. Some chiropractors were getting into nutrition and functional medicine and treating um, non-musculoskeletal conditions. Some were doing what you're saying, trying to basically create um, you know, lifetime patients and have uh, subscriptions. Is that what you call this? subscription base? So there were all these models of chiropractic, and I wasn't quite sure what I was, but after 25 years, it became very clear to me that, that the unique role the chiropractors play in the healthcare system is we do spine care very well. And that started crystallizing with me. And I said, that's where I want my research to be, about spine care. And would it be correct to say that the majority of people 
either are going to have a low back injury or have had a low back injury at some point in their life? Oh my gosh, that's the understatement of the of the of the century. Um, low back pain is the number one cause of disability worldwide. It's the second, believe it or not, it's the second most common reason people will see a doctor. Uh, you know, the flu or cold symptoms, the common cold is number one. Back pain is number two. And here's another surprising statistic. Back pain is the third most costly condition. Um, if, you, if you talk to any insurance company in the United States, including United Healthcare, which is the largest, third most costly condition. Cancer is number one. Heart disease is number two. Back pain is number three. Shocking statistic. And I know I graduated from college in 1990, so I'm a little bit younger than you, not much. But I know there's so many people you meet, whether you're in the athletic training field or I have friends who are physical therapists, and they always talk, or people very often talk about having a back injury. It never goes away. And it sounds like from the reading I've done and people I've talked to, your idea with this uh, program that you're part of developing, the idea is maybe you won't make back problems go away, but you're going to enable people to not have to worry about them as much and not make it so much a priority of their life by getting them proper treatment faster. What is the program that you were part of and how did that come about? Um, I assume we're speaking of this primary spine practitioner certificate program. Yes, I didn't say that because it's, uh, I was afraid I would bumble the words. Yes, so we developed a couple of years ago uh, here at the University of Pittsburgh a primary spine practitioner certificate course. Um, it's not a degree. It's a... It's a um, a post-professional certificate program aimed at both chiropractors and physical therapists. And the, the, the goal of the certificate program is to identify those chiropractors and those physical therapists, we said the lines are blurring, um, we're trying to identify those practitioners who really want to devote themselves to high-quality spine care and kind of set themselves apart from their colleagues as being the go-to people if you have a back or neck problem. And I know I had the good fortune or bad fortune a few years ago to herniate a second disc. And I knew just from my background, I was not a surgical case and I wanted physical therapy. So I went to see an orthopod telling him, I don't want an injection. I don't want surgery. Can I get physical therapy? But there was a time period, even though I had a few ins from people that I knew, it took a while to get in, and it was probably eight or nine days before I was actually able to see a physical therapist. Is the primary spine care practitioner program designed so somebody who has a back problem can potentially get in faster than that? Well, the certificate program is not geared towards um, telling people how to run their practices. I think what you're running into is a, a common problem in the United States is and frankly, it's one of the reasons that the chiropractic professions flourished over the years, is that if you have back pain, you want to be seen right away. And if you call your primary care doc and they say, we can get you in a week or two, it's like, heck no, I'm not waiting. I'll, let me go somewhere where I can be seen right away. And by the way, I've heard, you know, this chiropractic thing might work. Well, I'll try that. And chiropractors get people in very quickly as a rule. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's made the profession flourish, as well as getting quick results with patients. And I'm curious, why is it that chiropractors are able to get patients in so quickly? Well, another interesting fact, you know, that in most of the healthcare professions now, let's just talk about physical therapists, for example. The vast majority, well over 80% of physical therapists are employed by a clinic, right? 75% of chiropractors are in solo practice, right? They run their own practice, they're by themselves, they're not part of a big system, and so they're more flexible in what they can do. I mean, they kind of run their own show. And they're not salaried employees of a big company. So it, it creates a different kind of model of delivering the care. Why or how was the decision to come up with this uh, primary spine care practitioner program? Because I know from what you said a few minutes ago and from what I've read, you're accepting both uh, chiropractors and physical therapists in. And even though the lines are blurred, we always know that there are egos involved and people who are worried about other professions stepping on their toes, not just in chiropractic and not just in physical therapy, just across the medical, the movement field. Yeah, well, so I'll be quite honest about this. It's a very bold move that we're taking here. We, we like to say that we're profession agnostic. How's that for a good term? Um, it, you, know, you hear a lot about patient-centered care. This is patient-centered care. This program is we want to improve spine care. We don't care um, what degree the person has. 
um, we need to improve spine care in the United States. It's terrible. People with back pain get ping ponged around um, from pr- practitioner to practitioner with nobody kind of in charge of their case. Um, it, it, it's almost like you come to a path in the woods and you're lost and you're trying to get out of the woods and you have maybe eight paths to choose from with no guide. And you choose path A and you, you wander around and guess what? You, you're right back where you started. And you choose another path and you wander around and you're right back where you started. And so we figured that just like in primary care medicine, if you have a, a pain in your body, you're not sure what it is, the primary care provider can guide you if they can't do it themselves, they can guide you to what you need. We need the same kind of thing for patients that have back and neck pain. I'm always curious when people develop new programs or programs that are different. I think it's very clear just from my knowledge why chiropractors are in the program, why physical therapists are in the program. Are physicians allowed in the program too? Do you have uh, some primary care physicians who say, you know, this might be something that can be a valuable part of my practice, or is that something that for a variety of reasons they aren't included? Well, this is interesting. No, we're not, we don't limit the, the primary spine practitioner certificate to only physical therapists and chiropractors. We, it's open to any licensed healthcare professional. But we're, there's not a lot of interest in primary care medicine. And we've approached the primary care medicine physicians here at UPMC, and invariably, they just, they don't have the time or interest for it. I mean, primary care physicians are trained in internal medicine. Right? Back pain is not one of their priorities. And we actually have a quote from one, from one of our physicians who said that. If a patient sees me, I'm more worried about their diabetes, their hypertension, their thyroid problem, their kidney problem. If they have back pain, that's the least of my worries. And so we're finding that primary care physicians are very much in favor of delegating back pain or neck pain over to physical therapists and chiropractors because they just tend to be the practitioners have the most knowledge in those fields. Has there been any interest from uh, osteopaths or physical medicine physicians as, as far as this program goes? Yes, we have a lot of, actually we have a lot of interest from physical medicine and rehab physicians and osteopathic physicians. Um, but again, at, to manage patients at the primary care level, meaning that you're the first contact provider 80% of patients that have low back pain, for example, you have an acute onset of back pain, 80, 85%, maybe even more of those patients, they don't need specialty care. And so a physical medicine rehab doc is really more of a specialist. So for them to see the 80 or 85% of people who don't need specialty care, it's kind of below their pay grade. So they're interested in this model. And I think that in some sense, we see the the physical therapists and chiropractors who've been through our primary spine practitioner training can almost act as the nurse practitioner, if you will, to the physical medicine and rehab physician or the osteopathic physician, or even potentially to a primary care physician. And I know Pennsylvania has direct access for physical therapists. Uh, are there states, and you may not know this, that don't have direct access where the physical therapists may not be able to be the primary care person for uh, a spine injury? Well, yeah, so I do, I do know a lot about this. Um, the vast majority of states um, have direct access to physical therapy. What that means for your audience, if they're not familiar with it, is people think that you need to have a prescription from a medical doctor to get physical therapy services. That's not true in Pennsylvania and the majority of states in the United States. But here's the rub. Very few Americans know that. Uh, there's been surveys done nationally We've asked people, do you know that you can see a chiropractor without a prescription? No. Uh, And we know the utilization rates are extremely low. They're about 7%. So when I say that, of patients who have an acute episode of back pain, when they're asked, who who was the first provider you saw? Um, A little over 50% say, I saw a primary care physician. 40% say a chiropractor. 7% say a physical therapist. And that's even in states where there's direct access. So there's a huge awareness problem out there. But that doesn't preclude, even in, even in a state where the physical therapist cannot be the first contact provider, they still can be the first ca- contact provider if they're working in a medical facility. 
And it's something if they get in to see their primary care physician rather than the primary care physician saying, we need to get you into physical therapy. If they have a good relationship, they see we need to get you into physical therapy. And we have these specific physical therapists that we know who are primary spine care practitioner certified. Yes. So what I just thought about it, the greatest example of this is, is in the VA system. So m- most people don't realize that if you go to a VA facility, those providers there, um, for example, a physical therapist practicing at a VA hospital in a state where they're not allowed to see patients direct access, within the VA, they can. They're almost like Indian reservations, <laughs> right? They don't have to follow the state law. They follow their own law, right, which is a military <laughs> facility. So physical therapists within the military for years have had direct access. In many facilities, they're the first contact provider for back pain. And in some DOD facilities, physical therapists can actually order MRIs, x-rays, give medications, which they're not allowed by state law to do, but because the military is about efficiency. So the military and VA system have found out years ago that this primary spine practitioner model works. They'd rather, and there are a lot of chiropractors in the VA now too as well. And the model is, let's get those back pain patients to a physical therapist or chiropractor instead of one of our physicians. We don't have, they're too busy to be seeing back and neck pain. So the military has already adopted the PSP model. They just don't call it that. So in some respects, we're modeling that in the civilian world. I know I've mentioned before on other podcasts, I'm a fairly active member of the NSCA. And one of the reasons I like this organization is that you can go there and you can see chiropractors, you can see physical therapists, you can see athletic trainers, strength coaches, personal trainers. And there really isn't a whole lot of silo knowledge in the particular area of uh, resistance training because you have all of these professions. When you started this program with chiropractors and physical therapists, was there blowback from any chiropractors or physical therapists? Of course, not naming names saying, wait a second, I don't want to work with a chiropractor or I don't want to work with a physical therapist or why are they here? What would be your guess? Hell yes. Yes, of of course. I mean, it'd be silly for me to say, oh no, everything is, you know, peachy and we don't have any, any blowback. Sure. There was a, there was a lot of dissent uh, from both sides. Um, you know, there are chiropractors saying you're selling out the profession to physical therapy. The physical therapists say you're selling out the profession to chiropractors. Um, so we just ignore that noise and move forward. If you don't, in fact, that's great. If you feel that way, then don't come into this program. We don't want you. I know just uh, having had low back problems and knowing people who have you really don't care who's treating you if they're good. You don't care if they're a chiropractor. You don't care if they're a physical therapist. You don't care if they're a medical doctor. If they help you and you get better, that's what matters. And I agree. I mean, that's what patient-centered care is about. I mean, I don't have any tolerance for this blowback because we're trying to help people get better with back pain, the number one cause of disability in the world. There are a lot of people that need our help. And I, do, I think it's, um, it's sad when professionals are fighting with each other over, over turf. Um, I have a nice little quote on my wall here about, we talk about turf wars. Um, turf is the territory that a gang or a tribe claims as its own. Really? Are we into like tribalism here with healthcare professionals over what's going to help a patient? I, again, I have no tolerance for that. W- one interesting analogy here is think of what's happened over the past maybe 10 or 20 years with respect to nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in the primary care setting. You know, when I grew up, you saw the doctor. There was no other person you would see. Then as time went by, you went to a primary care clinic and they said, hey, Mike, we got this physician, you know, Dr. Jones is too busy today. Could you see his physician assistant? Well, okay, I'll give it a try. And now, what primary care clinic do you go to that doesn't have um, a medically trained physician, an osteopathic physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, do you really care, right? If you go in there with an ache or a pain and one of them can see you and they're all qualified, yeah, sure, some of them are more qualified than others, but they're all delivering primary care medicine. You don't care. I think we're going to predict, I predict that one day it'll be like that with um, primary care clinics offering musculoskeletal care. There'll be multiple practitioners there including physical therapists and chiropractors, my back hurts. Well, one of our people can see you. Great. I don't care who they are. I don't care what their degree is. 
I'm here for back pain. And you've got somebody who's qualified to see me. I'm happy to see them, whatever their degree is. I know the physical therapy profession uh, has a number of specialty certifications. And I'm curious if you see with this melding of healthcare professions or hopefully not putting my foot in my mouth, the blurring where the patient-centered care where you just want to see somebody who's going to help you better, help you get better. Do you see the day where maybe in addition to primary spine care uh, practitioners, there's going to be maybe shoulder specialists that blurs the line, knee specialists, hip specialists? Or do you think it's more low back is the big emphasis because so many people have back problems or back injuries? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that the... Um, I don't know is really my answer. I think at some point there's too much subspecialization. I think that there's different levels of care. There's a, the primary care where if you come in with shoulder pain, for example, 50% of shoulder pain is actually coming from the neck. People come in with what they think is hip pain. More than 50% of that's coming from the low back. So sp spine problems are by far and away the most common musculoskeletal disorder. And I didn't want to get into this, but most of our primary spine practitioners, the physical therapists and chiropractors who come in, they're good at any kind of musculoskeletal diagnosis and triage. So, no, my prediction would be we're not going to have, you know, primary shoulder practitioners and primary knee practitioners. We're going to have primary musculoskeletal practitioners, spine being the predominant, but maybe it's spine and musculoskeletal. And again, that analogy with internal medicine works really well. So here's, here's my um, delusion of grandeur, that someday we're going to have primary care clinics, and that primary care clinic's got door A and door B. I have a pain in my body. Ben, where's your pain? I don't know. It's in my chest. Let me examine you. Oh, that pain in your chest, it seems to be coming from your back. Go to door A, the musculoskeletal door. All right? And then somebody will take care of you over there. Oh, that pain in your chest, that seems to be coming from your lungs. Go to the door B. And so in door B, we've got physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, the primary care doc. In door A, we've got physical therapists, chiropractors, athletic trainers. I don't know who, but there's people that do the triage on the musculoskeletal end. That's what we need. And primary care is going to this kind of team-based model. And then that's going to handle 80, 85% of the cases. And there will be a minority that needs to go on to specialty care, but the people behind each of those doors can then direct people to the right path so they're not stuck in the woods again trying to say, oh, which path is going to get me out of here? And I'm on my own. We're talking with Dr. Mike Snyder. He is a chiropractor and a PhD teaching in the physical therapy program at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm curious with this uh, primary spine care practitioner uh, certification. I wasn't aware of it until a chiropractor that I see mentioned that you would be a great interview. And then I started looking at it. I'm like, wow, why does everybody not know about this? Somebody's going to hurt their back who's listening to this. We don't wish that on them, but we know it's going to happen fairly soon after listening to this. How do they find somebody who's gone through this program? Well, the program's new, so we don't have a lot of people to send to. And let me say this. It might sound like I'm um, shooting myself in the foot. I'm not trying to say that... Um, only people who have been through our certificate program um, are capable of managing spine. Uh, so there are a lot of physical therapists out there, a lot of chiropractors out there who are doing a fine job at spine care who don't need to do this certification program. So when people are looking for a good practitioner, I tell them, just go through friends and family. Your, your primary care physician may know a good physical therapist or chiropractor to send you to. They don't have to necessarily be through this program. However, those who have been through this program, to us, we see it as sort of like that good housekeeping seal of approval, right? That this, if you see somebody who's been through our program, you're more likely than not to have a good experience. It's still not 100%, but your percentages of having a good experience are better. Um, so right now, unfortunately, I can't give you, um, you know, a list. I do have a list of people who have been through our program, but we're not kind of advertising that to the world yet. Eventually, we will. I know one of the things I often joke with people is people often spend more time finding a mechanic for their fancy car than somebody to treat whatever their medical problem is. And I think what you've said, word of mouth, asking people sometimes to find the right person, you really have to be a pain, pun intended, and make it so somebody wants to give you an answer so you'll go away. I would agree. 
So we're talking to Dr. Mike Snyder. I'm curious just briefly for maybe physical therapists are listening to this and we know depending on the generation, some people don't like to read. I took the opportunity last night to read up a read up on the webpage about the program. But I'm curious, just kind of briefly, somebody's listening to this and say, boy, that's a really interesting idea. I'd like to learn more about it. What exactly is the program as far as how long does it take? And just in broad terms, how does it differ from somebody just basically going to a couple of continuing education classes over a couple of weekends? Well, our program, um, first of all, to come into our program, we have some prerequisites because we're looking for people who want to jump to the next level. This is not for beginners, right? This is the advanced class, right? If you're taking dance classes, for example, or music lessons, we're the advanced class, not the beginner's class. So we want people coming in who have good manual therapy skills, that have a good understanding of rehabilitative exercises and movement control. And um, for example, a lot of chiropractors don't know much, much about exercise. We say, well, then go take those classes first, then come back. Some physical therapists haven't had a lot of manual therapy training, Go take those classes first, then come back to us. Because then what we do is provide a four-unit program. And each of our units consists of a lot of online material as well as an associated three-day weekend course. Um, and when I say a lot of online, it's probably about a five or six to one ratio. The number of hours online heavily outweighs what we do in the weekend. And so our first unit is on the basic principles of delivering primary spine care and doing a good history and examination. Our second unit is focused purely on the lumbar spine, the low back. Our third unit is focused exclusively on the cervical spine or neck. And our fourth unit is all about integrative care, case scenarios, and managing um, back pain and neck pain, by the way. I know one of the things, no matter what your certification is, you often see CEUs are required and you get towards the end of the CEU period and you can watch on social media or talking to your friends. There's really two groups of individuals. There are those groups who are scrambling to find the courses that offer the most bang for the buck, the most bang being the number of CEUs. And there's those people who don't worry about it because they're already curious and they've made it a that they've made a decision that, look, I'm just going to continue my education. It isn't a problem. It sounds like this program is going to be for the latter group of physical therapists and chiropractors. It's not something that you can just show up and get the certificate and put another certificate on your wall. Oh, that's definitely true. And it is interesting that we do provide continuing education credits, but you can tell where people are at when they, when we have a physical therapist or chiropractor that's interested in taking our program, very often don't even ask if it's um, continuing education credits eligible. They ask all about the program, what it's about. And when people do that, I realize I've got the right kind of person. When people, f the first question out of their mouth is, am I going to get continuing ed credits? Right away, my mind's going towards, maybe this person is not a good fit for us because if that's all they care about. Um, but interestingly enough, like I said, the majority of people have been through our program, they could care less whether they get continuing ed credits. We're talking with Dr. Mike Snyder. I'm curious, you've described an interesting career path. And I know thinking back to when I graduated from, high, uh, from college and became certified as an athletic trainer, the idea of talking to people and working with people who had low back problems just absolutely bored me to tears. I had no interest. And it's interesting as I get older, my curiosity about what causes back problems and how to prevent back problems increases. Looking back to when you started your career as a chiropractor, do you think after six or seven years of working and seeing patients, if this sort of program had been around, you you would have jumped at it? Do you think it still would have taken you a few more years to say, hey, you know, this might have some use for me? Um, I think would have jumped at it uh, because those people have been in practice for a couple of years start realizing back pain is a lot more complicated than we thought. And it's a lot more interesting. You know, we've published on this a little bit, we, um, this idea that all back pain patients kind of fit into one bucket is a gross oversimplification. And I think what we've learned over the years now, when I was in chiropractic school, you know, back pain was, well, the bone's out of place, you put it back in place, take the pressure off the nerve, you're gonna be fine. It was this really me mechanical, simplistic model. And as you start going through the years, you start realizing that um, X-rays and MRI images don't correlate with back pain, which is kind of weird, right? You think, boy, that's a really bad, herniated disc I see in the MRI, 
Only to find out the patient's like, yeah, you know, it's not really that bad. Other people have small disc protrusions and they have terrible pain. So we're thinking, wow, what's that about? Then as years go by, we start understanding a lot about the psychology of back pain, right? That some people are kind of stoic and they can put up with the pain. And other people are, I've heard the term fragilistas, uh, which is an interesting term. Some people are just more sensitive to pain. So the psychology, the imaging, and then we start realizing social factors, the kind of work that you have, the nutrition that you have, and it starts getting really, really interesting. Genetics, we're starting to find out now, unfortunately, has to do with some kinds of back pain. So I'm very excited. We're, we actually, um, University of Pittsburgh, um, just received a huge grant, a $25 million grant from NIH. It's the biggest I've been involved with, and I am involved with this study, and it's to phenotype chronic back pain. So this is going to be probably going throughout, we have a five-year grant. I have a feeling it's going to be a 20-year study. And in this study, we're going to take a 1,000 patients in Pittsburgh of chronic back pain, get blood samples on them to look for inflammatory biomarkers. We're going to do um, saliva swabs and do genetic testing, looking for genetic polymorphisms. We're going to be doing a series of physical exam procedures to see what movements and physical movement characteristics might be related to different types of back pain. And we're going to do a whole bunch of psychological and social questionnaires and looking at all of those aspects. So it's a huge undertaking. And um, this is where I think the future of back pain is. There, it's a multidimensional problem that requires a lot of different inputs from different healthcare professionals. So this idea that silos need to be worried about what they're doing, I don't think they need to be. We've been talking with Dr. Mike Schneider. I think he's given an interesting background about how he got where he is today. We're overlooking the river, so he's obviously done well with an office with windows. But more importantly, I think he really exemplifies what we want to have for moving to live is just people who are doing things just a little bit differently. Dr. Schneider, thanks for taking time to talk to FitLab PGH and moving to live about your career path and about your research in the area of back pain and back problems. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Moving to Live. Make sure you check out the show notes for contact information for our latest guest, as well as links about all the things we talked about. Intro and exit music is Traveling Light by Jason Shaw. You can subscribe to Moving to Live on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play, and be notified about new episode releases. Have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Drop us an email, mov2liv at gmail.com. Connect with us on Twitter or Instagram, both underscore MOV number two LIV. Please tell your friends about Moving to Live. It's a go-to place for information for movement and exercise professionals and amateur aficionados who understand that movement is part of what makes your life complete. Until next week, keep on moving.